Hi everyone, welcome to Hooked on Onyx. I'm Andrea, co-founder of Onyx Coffee Lab and I run operations here. And I'm John, co-founder and creative director here at Onyx. So take us back to those beginning days of Onyx. What were your hopes for the future? I mean, I think when we started Onyx, one of my hopes was just that people in Northwest Arkansas would be able to like drink really nice coffee and recognize it for all of its inherent properties and all the things that made it good. And so, I mean, when we first started, it was, there was so much focus on just talking to people about what's the difference between specialty coffee and other kinds of coffee that you get access to. That was like one of our big focuses in the beginning was just introducing specialty coffee to to Northwest Arkansas and then trying to bridge that gap between customers not having very much knowledge or education in the in the field and just how do we like make it feel natural, engaging, but also accurate and and true to all of the work that goes into making great coffee. I like that like you were like focused on the customer experience and I think on the other side, the goal was really to create a coffee brand for coffee people that like something the industry would value and that as we were working as baristas and we were working bar together, um, a brand that would like speak kind of for us to the coffee community and then also sort of resonate with the rest of what we found to be like kind of the greatest industry. It's like we found this acceptance in the coffee industry and all our friends were in the industry and we we loved, I don't know, that inclusive kind of like, almost felt like this secretive group, I know that's kind of binary, but of this like community, this hospitality community, right? And then it's like, and we wanted a brand that was focused on that. Not just to be accepted by that, but that was like, it was for that group. Um, and Andre just made sure that other people also wanted to drink our coffee. Have there been any particular moments or touch points in the last 10 years that have stuck out to you? You want to start? I mean, for how sure. Many, how much time do we have? Like, I think there's all sorts of milestones of like, what I'm going to call like, I don't know if this should be recorded, like the generations of staff that we have like mm. grown up with yeah. and have moved on. And like, I tend to mark our years by that, those groups of people that like started off being honestly the same age as we were. And yeah. we had a lot. And then it was sort of like, it became sort of a new generation. And we were like, oh wow, there's like so much talent out there. Ta more people more talented than us. And so that was like a growth kind of like signpost and then I don't know, there's just, every generation, there's like two, three years, there's like a group of people that are great at what they do and we fall in love with them, they move on, they go do other great things. And I sort of use that as these kind of like tiered ideas of who we were. So when I look back on the 10 years, I think of it in terms of the groups of people that were with us. And so I don't think like in 2018, I think like, these five people I can really recall that I worked with closely and then in 2020 it was these three people and, um, and they leave their mark and their fingerprints so that when we look back on things I do I also think of the the bricks kind of they laid and we still see those whether it's like a training protocol or the way we train roasters now or buying green coffee or like whatever it is it's like it's like that's still their thing that's here yeah. Um, which is cool. When I'm just asked about the moments that stick out, there's a couple. So early on, we had this really nice geisha coffee from the Cafe Grand Hall La Esperanza, and we had an opportunity to send it out to Charles Pavinsky at GMB for him to use in competition, and we roasted like two pounds of it. And we didn't even, I think we did one cupping bowl of it. It was so precious and rare and expensive. And it was all our money. <laughs> it was like all of our money in this like one, like half five pound bag. And 
It was so exciting, and I got to make one espresso shot with it. So I had like 20 grams, and I put it into like a Malconig. Um, EK or something. I don't know. It wasn't an EK. It was the. Oh, the the one before the, the peak. The R2D2 round thing. Oh. Perfect. Peak. No, it's before the peak. Anyway, it's like I threw it in there and I made a shot and it wasn't even prepared properly, but it felt like the greatest coffee I'd ever had. And I just remember thinking how excited I was that like I got to actually make that coffee that I was able to like touch it and that somebody that I looked up to in the industry really wanted that coffee and how cool that was. Mm -hmm. um, I also remember opening our Bentonville shop and feeling that we were going to have a slow growth and like just hoping that people were going to come in and I remember like unlocking the door on that first day and I think I was making like scheduled to make drinks or something and I just remember this whole list of things I had to do and I was like as soon as it slows down I'll do it and we opened the door and there was a line the entire day until we closed and then there was literally a line for the two weeks and that list pretty much like never got done and I just remember thinking how cool it was that people were coming into the shop in another community that we weren't in and mm -hmm. looking for coffee and just being so excited that it was like gonna work <laughs> and Alika Alika's wife opened that shop for us and she was awesome yeah Lauren, Lauren. yeah and uh, Alika was there as a barista <laughs> There was a there is a moment thinking of the coffee. It's kind of comical. It's not to throw them under the bus, but I I do know I like there was this thing about um, the Petersons geisha. So I've been riding La Esmeralda. I don't know four times a year <laughs> for years. eight years to sell me their coffee because I used to have to beg people to sell me their coffee and no no response and like. As Dakota took over on the green buying or really came into his own, he's like, yeah, I got some samples from La Esmeralda. Like, they just want to, they want to see if we're interested. And, like, he had, like, <laughs> what I felt like was, like, a dozen samples and, like, an open-ended, like, could buy as much as he wanted. Yeah. I remember being so excited and so frustrated at the same time and thinking, like, oh, okay, so um, this is going to work. right at the very beginning. It was, so John and Jeremy, who's on the creative team, have been working together since the very beginning. And they went to high school together. They've been friends for a really long time. And basically, through some brainstorming sessions and John just kind of talking about what we were hoping for for the brand, like there just came these really cool sketches that came out of some of these sessions. And one of those sketches was this phrase, never settle for good enough. And it just like felt so right. We were so hungry and so passionate and that just felt like the vibe. Wow. That's my- I would agree with everything except for the last the word last and the weird word. head tilt. I mean, gosh, it could go in so many directions. It is, I mean, I'm proud that like, there's something where our, we can feed our family <laughs> off something we built. I mean, built along with a million other people, but that's, um, you know, already further than I ever thought I'd be in my life. Uh, I'm proud to see my wife flourish as like a leader. Um, that a bunch of people look up to, that I look up to, that I think handles things in an incredible way. Um, I'm proud of the architecture and like the things I think we have created some staples in the community and we've been very, um, I think we have done, this feels like a bunch of bragging, I feel like we've done the hard work in saying no to the right things in order to be to grow really slow in a world that says you should build your company really fast and sell to the next yeah. big company and cash out. 
I think that we have purposely um, been a part of this community and grown with each little city in Northwest Arkansas and not left to chase things that um, would probably be successful, but never felt right. For me, I'm really proud to always say that we have the best baristas in the country here. Like I, I've been saying that for a long time, but I really feel it's true. And anytime we have folks like go to events or even leave and work at other coffee companies, they'll kind of come back around and they're like, oh my gosh, like I have so many things I learned here and so much skill and just feeling so proud that like no matter who comes in the door at Onyx, they're about to have a really, really great cup of coffee, arguably maybe the best one they've ever had. And that feels so cool because all of that exists because our team cares about what they're doing. They have like incredible pride in things that they make with their hands and it's really beautiful. Yeah, the light, the we used to talk about it, I think, with Intelligentsia, but there was like a, it always felt like the mark of a good company was not really how they were performing in the moment, but it was like when once those people leave, Mm. What I loved about Intelli, and really when we started, was like, I used to see people that were baristas there that went and started Go Get Em or GMB, Ruby Coffee, like all these like great handsome. little small, handsome, like, oh yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace. <laughs> all, all these great little roasteries <laughs> that like spawn from a company and now it's really fun to see um, people go off and they're like, importers or they are working on roasters or they've started cafes and like um, how healthy that is to like not to physically push people out but to also like see the fruit long term of what they're developing like yeah. it's me excited that like people are staying in coffee becoming their own thing um, that legacy kind of thing is really cool looking forward what are you most excited about I'm excited about so many things. <laughs> there you go. Done. I'm excited to continue to create really cool hospitality moments in kind of a post-hospitality world. I feel like the pandemic has just made things feel differently in service. And I think our team is just really putting out incredible service. In, in a world that like maybe has devalued service and it's more transactional. And so I'm like super excited about continuing that spirit that we've kind of always had, but in a new way that is becoming more and more special. Um, we're gonna open a couple more cafes, I'm sure. Um, so I'm like really excited about those and I'm just excited to continue to grow our team and grow our coffee offerings and just watching watching people progress and become more and more professional in coffee is just something really fun to be a part of. Mm. Mine's more practical. I think I, <laughs> I got dreams. I think I'm excited. We're like at the size now where we can make some real impact. So like the things we want to do on the farm level or on the on the green coffee side have been good and like I think we've made strides and like we're just now feeling the ramifications of this like to be honest of this full transparency kind of concept now that we're five years in and getting like a better feedback loop with producers and importers and roasters and everything is sort of like doesn't feel aggressive anymore it wasn't like we're trying to make some big change or disrupt the industry it's like a standard and that's really nice coinciding with because we've grown we have more buying power and so I think the things that we've wanted to do before like the projects have been good and have made little incremental things here and there and but um, we finally have the volume and I think the will and and the team uh, to like make big big moves now uh, when it comes to the changes we want to see from the producer to the roaster. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Like, it, uh, you know, it takes, I think, a certain am amount of just volume in coffee to, m to make a dent in such a old, crusty, big system. <laughs> um, 
and we're still like a very small little spoon digging in this dirt wall, but like we're now able to kind of like, I think, crack the foundation a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to see the next 10 years, like when all this is actualized, but on a broader scale. And as more people get involved and have good ideas with how we can like make these sort of dreams or these conversations of, you know, you have late night with a producer, with other roasters, or all, all these things that everyone feels aligned to want to do, but no one like takes a step to do or has the volume to do it. I think we're gonna finally make that push. It's like, can we make, can we make high-end specialty coffee pop culture and therefore big enough to pull the volume to make the changes that the whole specialty injury has been talking about, at least since we joined, but has never actualized or has never banded together to do because as soon as someone gets semi big, you know, they tend to move off for quality dips and what they buy dips or whatever, whatever happens. And it's like, if we can keep the quality there and the floor there and actually purchase that amount of coffee, can, can we move that into the public sphere? What does that do? I don't even know that I'm verbalizing it right. There's something exciting about that idea. Thanks for joining Hooked on Onyx and we'll see you next time.